uh, suggested that that uh, the staff go ahead and administer the agenda. So uh, Andrew will be with us just in a minute, but I'm gonna go ahead and get us started here so that we can get through um, hopefully much of the business on the agenda here today. Welcome to the Regional Growth Committee. It is Thursday, March 21st, and the time is 9.26. Um, so we're gonna have introductions around the table and Andrea will read those members and alternates attending online. Um, and then after we do that, we'll spend a, a few minutes getting to know our new members. So after the regular introductions, we'll uh, turn to each of the new Regional Growth Committee members and look forward to hearing from each of them as they spend a minute telling us a little bit more about themselves. But we'll do that after the quick around the table uh, and online introductions. Andrea? Okay, those that we have joining us online today are Reed Ewing, Ryan Beck, Ginger Chen, Sharon Bolos, Laura Hansen, Don Ramsey, Mayor Fippen, Lorreen Kamalu, Miranda Jones Cox, Kevin Cromar, Ari Bruning, uh, Lauren Palmer, uh, Jory Johnner, Ted Knowlton, Andrew Gruber. <laughs> These people are here in person too. And myself, Andrea Pearson. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Ted. And then um, we did not do introductions in the room already. Not yet. Okay, well, let's do it. Rosie. Rosie Hernandez, Wasatch Front Regional Council. Jordan Chandler, WFRC. Andrea Olson, UDOT. Allison Stroud, Sandy City Council. Monica Zoltansky, Sandy Mayor with Kim Bell, Deputy Mayor. Tammy Tran, Kaysville City Mayor. We introduced ourselves already, I believe. Ted Knowlton, WFRC. Eric Barney, Mayor Magna. Nana Mayor, Mayor Stockton. Russ Fox, Director of Planning for UTA. Carlton Christensen, Trustee for the Utah Transit Authority, and I beat Mayor Burton. He did beat me. We were at the same meeting right before this. Uh, he left early. Dirk Burton, Mayor of West Jordan. That means Carlton didn't ride his bicycle. <laughs> And now in the audience. Miranda Jones-Cox, WFRC. Madison Avilas, WFRC. Jory Johnner, WFRC, Long Range Planning Group. Byron Head, WFRC. Adam Olson with Midvale City. Meg Townsend, WFRC, Community and Economic Development. Marion Florence, Finance, WFRC. Taylor Jensen, Planning West Jordan. Brandon Weston, UDOT. Matt Ryan, WFRC. Tim Watkins, WFRC. Bert Granberg, WFRC Analytics Group. Chrissy Dahlberg, WFRC. Hi, Julie Bjornstad, WFRC Long Range Planning. Lauren Victor, WFRC. Seamus Guetta, WFRC. Okay, terrific. Thank you, everybody. Now, we have a full agenda, and we are starting late because of the traffic situation that I described, so we're going to move quickly, but there's always time to welcome new members, uh, and we, as Ted said, we want to give each of them just a moment to introduce themselves, and I think I've got the list right that the new members of RGC this year, we've got Mayor Tran, um, we've got Mayor Barney, we've got Mayor Fippen online, we've got... Uh, Mayor Palmer, who's sort of a new member. He was serving as an alternate before, but now he's the representative of the Utah League of Cities and Towns. And we've got Kevin Cromar from the Air Quality Board. So in that order, would you just take a moment to introduce yourself? Mayor Tran. Sure, thank you. I'm excited to be part of this committee. I'm in Kaysville. This is my first term. Um, love being engaged and love the regional planning. So happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Mayor Barney. Yeah, so Eric Barney, uh, Magna, uh, born and raised in the Salt Lake Valley. Uh, this is my first term as well. Uh, excited to usher in Magna's new identity as a city in May, thanks to House Bill 35, and excited for the growth that we're, we're seeing, and hopefully we can control it a little better. Thanks, Mayor. Let's go now to Mayor Fippen. Mayor Fippen, Far West City. Um, yeah, 
<laughs> this is my first term as mayor, a couple of terms as city council and planning commission before that. So I've been hanging around for a while, driving people crazy. So I'll be continuing to do so. We all need a little bit of that. Thanks, Mayor Fippen. And now Mayor Palmer uh, has, has made it into the room. Mayor, I just noted that you are, you've been involved with RGC, but you're now a new appointee on behalf of the Utah League of Cities and Towns. Would you introduce yourself? Yep, so Lauren Palmer, mayor out in Harriman. I've been following the process again, attending as an alternate as much as possible and looking forward to be a more of a participating guest. And like everybody, others have said, passionate about this stuff. And I love the planning and what's going on in the, the area. So Great. pleasure to be a part. Thank you. And then uh, Kevin Cromar. Yeah, Kevin Cromar. I serve on the Utah Air Quality Board. I'm happy to be on the committee. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Kevin was a longtime member of our Transcom and has now shifted over to the Regional Growth Committee, and we welcome him. I think, did I miss anybody who's a new member this year? Mayor Melly is joining us from Stockton. He's not a member of the committee, but we're always happy to have you here, so thank you. Okay. Um, now, I'm, as I said, this is a little unorthodox that staff is navigating this meeting, but given the circumstances, we're going to uh, uh, proceed forward. Um, so the next item is action on the minutes of the RGC meeting on January 18th of 2024. Are there any comments or questions? And if not, is there a motion to approve? Uh, Mr. Um, Chair Pro Tem, uh, I would move approval of the minutes. <laughs> Moved by Trustee Christensen, second by Mayor Tran. Any comments or questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed say nay. Okay, the minutes are approved. Next item is item two on the agenda is public comment. Do we have any members of the public here in the room that would like to offer comments? I'm seeing none. Are there any members online or members of the public online, Andrea? that would like to offer comments. Okay, seeing none, we will move on to uh, item three. Ted, should we do item three, RGC roles, responsibilities, and schedule, or should we wait for Mayor Dan Doy on that one? I think it's okay to, to do it now. Okay, let's do it. Ted, take it away. Okay. I had a momentary uh, question whether I should make a call. Ted is making the walk to the podium. Hey, thank you. Uh, Ted, I'll say what we anticipated Mayor Dandoy was going to say, and then I'll turn it to you. Great. I'm sure that Mayor Dandoy would have wanted you to know that the Regional Growth Committee serves as the policy advisory body to the WFRC Council regarding long-range transportation planning, land use, and other growth-related issues. This is the first meeting with new members, and it's a great time to spend a few minutes on our role. So Ted Knowlton, who you all know is our deputy director and our chief planner, and the staff coordinator for the Regional Growth Committee is going to take a minute to discuss this item. Ted. Okay, thank you, Andrew. And I'm gonna be brief here, uh, but it is a great time to do this with new members. Let's go to the first slide. Um, our name as an organization is also the name of our deci decision-making body, the Wasatch Front Regional Council. You see that as the big uh, uh, polygon there in the middle. Now, that uh, decision-making body takes recommendations primarily from two committees. One of them is short-range focused programming of dollars. That's the Transportation Coordinating Committee. And then there is a Regional Growth Committee that focuses on long-range planning. We're going to talk a little bit about that, but you can kind of think of, that's, you can see Regional Growth Committee on the right side of this. You can roughly think of this as we are like uh, the Planning Commission to the council, the council being the Wasatch Front Regional Council, if you will. Um, now you see other lines that lead into the Regional Growth Committee. They include the Active Transportation Committee that we take into consideration uh, things from that committee. I won't talk about that committee just for the sake of time, but it's an unusual committee in that it, it's, it serves more than WFRC and it coordinates across multiple agencies. And then you see these two polygons that lead into the Regional Growth Committee. They are technical advisory committees. So the planners around the region, both in the Salt Lake Valley, that's that left box, and in the ogden Layton uh, area, which includes Brigham City um, and Morgan County as well, on the right box, Tooele included in the left box, uh, they also make recommendations to us as well. 
uh, um, digging through technical details. Let's go through the next slide. Um, so as the group that makes recommendations to the council on long range things, you can kind of think of two key areas where we focus. One of them is the Wasatch Choice vision. You may be familiar with this. Uh, I, I assume you are. This is our shared game plan for the coordination of regional transportation, local land use, and economic development activities. How do we coordinate these things to maintain our quality of life even as we grow? Uh, so we get into the coordination of transportation, land use, economic development in lots of our conversations. It is an underlying thread. That is one key space. We're like the steering committee for Wasatch Choice Vision. Let's go to the next slide. Oh no, go back, pardon me, one. You see these components. Uh, that means the regional transportation plan. It means thinking about the interplay with local planning uh, activities. Uh, we have a program called the Transportation and Land Use Connection Program. We oversee that work uh, as the Regional Growth Committee. And then there's uh, economic development activities as well. There's actually a separate entity, the Economic Development District, that digs into economic development. Now, I'm going to focus just for now one minute on the left box. Go to the next slide. We are also the steering committee for the regional transportation plan. You're going to fill that role today. Uh, we'll consider an amendment to both the process for making amendments, and we're going to consider project-related amendments to the plan. But you'll have this thread of the plan development for the regional transportation plan as part of what you attend to as the regional growth committee. I'm not gonna talk through this in detail. I'm just gonna go to the next slide so that we can keep on trucking, which is transportation lingo. Um, but this does mean that our focus actually changes year to year. It's not the same every year at regional uh, growth committee because we take on the, the tenor of the conversation in the development of the Wasatch Choice Vision and the Regional Transportation Plan. In this year, 2024, that really means we're exploring ideas. As we work towards 2027, that's adoption. And you can see these interim things, you know, explore scenarios, figure out the one scenario that we want to address. Let's break that into projects. That's 2026. And then let's apply fiscal constraint in the latter part of 2026 before we wrap it up into a updated Wasatch Choice vision and plan. I went through that super fast and I hope that that wasn't way too fast, but you get a sense of our focus as a committee will shift as we go year to year. Mayor Dandoy, welcome. It's great to see you. Glad you could get here safely. And uh, unless there's questions on that, this is a little bit of a just quick overview of the work of the Regional Growth Committee. Thank you, Ted, and thanks for uh, allowing me to at least be absent for in traffic for a few minutes. So sorry to be late. Thank you. Okay, uh, any comments, questions? Again, thank you, Ted. <clears throat> we do now have the uh, legislative debrief. I believe Miranda Cox is going to give us a quick debrief uh, of outcomes that come out of the 2024 general legislative sessions, including relevant transportation, housing, uh, in economic development, land use, and other legislation appropriation issues. Uh, looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Miranda? Hey, thank you, Mayor. Appreciate it. And it's nice to see some, uh, some faces again that we saw up on the Hill throughout the session, and it's good to see you here and not up on Capitol Hill. Um, I, w I, I guess I'll just, I want to be brief with, uh, with this overview. I think some of these concepts are similar, are uh, familiar to many of you of where we came out of the legislative session. Um, but I will just say that I, I think it was a very successful legislative session um, in terms of housing, in terms of transportation. Um, and uh, specifically, I do want to note that one thing in regard to housing, and the league has kind of been sharing this, is that um, the legislature took the approach of um, partnership and not preemption this session in that they really focused on providing 
tools to local governments um, to deal with housing challenges um, as opposed to taking local authority away to deal with some of those challenges. And so that's one very positive thing. And then again, in terms of transportation, um, we really saw yet another significant year of um, transportation investment. Over the past three to four years, the legislature has notably put you know, billions of dollars each legislative session into transportation investment, into multimodal transportation investment, into trails, transit, and roadway. And this year was not an exception. We saw that yet again. And so I'll quickly run through a, a few highlights. Um, let's first touch on transportation infrastructure appropriations. Uh, like I said, another significant year, over $1.2 billion in transportation investment um, for multimodal transportation. Uh, notably, uh, $775 million one time and $330 million ongoing um, into the Transportation Investment Fund, or the TIF, which is uh, the fund that UDOT ultimately prioritizes uh, that funding for uh, transportation projects. Um, the idea was the legislature put that funding in there to uh, to pay uh, to pay debt service, and in turn would free up existing TIF funding that could now be used for additional uh, transportation projects. And so, again, I mean, 775 million one time is particularly notable, but. 330 ongoing is, is very significant. So we'll see those funds into the TIF year after year. Uh, there was also $45 million ongoing funded to the Transit Transportation Investment Fund. Uh, and we this was one of the uh, appropriations that we had been kind of advocating for throughout the session um, because it is notable that it provides stable ongoing sources of funding for transit. Uh, the legislature tends to, at least over the past few years, provide one-time funding for specific projects, uh, but this year they put new ongoing money into the Transit Transportation Investment Fund. They did specifically put it in there for commuter rail improvements, so uh, you know the systems front runners, uh, the systems front runner system is our current commuter rail system. Um, and future improvements to that. Um, again, very notable. The legislature also put funding towards the point of the mountain transit stop. This was funded um, partly last year for a front runner stop at point of the mountain and received additional funding there. And then there were also a number of uh, legislatively directed projects, um, meaning that the legislature didn't say, here's a pot of money like let's let uh, transportation partners decide how to, to spend that money. They did select specific projects to fund. So a number of those were funded in Salt Lake County out of the County of the First Class Highway Projects Fund. Um, there was funding for a Cache Valley Transit bus um, facility, um, a number of other uh, projects down in Utah County. So really about 75 million plus dollars of specific uh, transportation projects. So that's kind of big picture where we landed as far as legislative appropriations for transportation this session. Yeah. Uh, there were a few notable uh, planning appropriations that uh, WFRC and some of our partners will be involved in moving forward. One is a transportation study for the power district in Salt Lake City. Um, this power district might be familiar to you as you've heard um, uh, plans for the potential Major League Baseball stadium and the redevelopment of that particular area. Uh, WFRC, along with our partners at UDOT UTA, Salt Lake City will be doing a transportation study to look at uh, roadway transit, active transportation um, plans and improvements in that area to accommodate that economic development to ensure that growth occurs in a way that uh, that limits um, any potential challenges. And then second, um, this recommendation came out of the Unified Economic Opportunity Commission for a market capacity analysis. This one's a little bit more niche of, of what it exactly does, but the idea is to look at how um, 
growth occurs, where development occurs, and what the market will ultimately allow for in, in certain areas for redevelopment, for infill, for new development, um, and, and align what the, where the market's at and what planned growth we already have in place. So this really builds on a lot of the work that we already have done here at WFRC. Uh, so our partner at um, the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity will be leading out on that. So I want to briefly touch on a few bills. It's challenging because there really were so many that we could touch on. And unfortunately, we don't have the time to, to do a, a full deep dive. But uh, notable to, to Regional Growth Committee, I wanted to um, discuss uh, housing and transit reinvestment zone changes, which wasn't a bill. First, home investment zone changes, and I'll get to that next, um, and, then a, and then a few others. So housing and transit reinvestment zones, as you are likely aware, is a tool available to communities with um, uh, fixed guideway public transit stations and planning for development around those stations, uh, specifically using tax increment financing to uh, to do these multi, uh, sorry, these mixed use developments and provide affordable housing. And so the latest changes um, to the HTRZ uh, statute, which was led by Senator Wayne Harper, uh, does things like it increases the affordability requirements of the housing units within an HTRZ, HTRZ development, clarifies which particular transit stations are eligible, uh, another notable thing is that it adds the promotion of um, owner-occupied housing. This was a big thing for the legislature this year, for the governor, is not just saying we want more housing, but we want housing that people can purchase, own, and then um, increase that equity uh, throughout the life of, of their home. And so um, this, uh, this change now promotes that in an HTRZ, which kind of to date has been um, a lot of uh, rental units in HTRZs. Uh, adds some additional members to an HTRZ committee and enhances the but-for analysis, um, which uh, basically is saying, um, but for this investment, um, this would have been like the value uh, in that area. So some really great changes to HTRZ amendments. And I know that a lot of your communities have either, be, either been involved in or, um, uh, or looked for an HTRZ in your communities. Tying off of uh, uh, housing and transit reinvestment zones is a new tool, not uh, primarily focused on housing around transit, um, but looking at more um, owner-occupied, single-family, um, maybe more missing middle type housing in city and town centers. So again, not the highest density around transit, but um, city and town centers, um, medium density. And the idea here is that al it allows, again, similar to an HTRZ, for tax increment to be captured for project and system infrastructure costs. Um, and has certain requirements for the densities um, and the mixed use development inside a uh, first home investment zone or a FIS is what we've been calling it. Um, inside the primary FIS zone, there's requirements for density of 30 units per acre, owner occupied affordable units. And then outside the FIS zone, um, there can be uh, additional owner-occupied single-family um, housing that is additionally also affordable at a lower density that can count towards the, the required density inside of FIS zone. This one can get a little technical, a little tricky, and trying to like do the math of like, okay, how, how do we make this work is, can be a bit challenging. We do have a really helpful uh, summary on this bill, on the provisions of the, the FIS and um, I think is worth taking a closer look at if you want to know a little bit more. So we'll be, I'll be sure to drop some of those resources in the chat uh, before we're done. Nate's but, on it. Nate's been dropping things oh, left Nate, and right you. as you're, as you're going Nate through here, these but... things. So <laughs> thanks, thanks Nate. Miranda, can I do yes, a quick Ted, interjection? Please. You already talked about it's a tool to help with city and town centers. Um, most of the Wasatch Choice city and town centers actually are not next to you know, rail transit. Um, Meritran, downtown Kaysville is an example. In my city, uh, the North Salt Lake Town Center 
there's so many examples. And so this is just one of these tools that can really help uh, communities, you know, fund the components of a city and town center that really helps uh, um, bring it together. Yeah, thanks, Ted. One of the questions we've gotten on this bill is, well, maybe it's not around transit or required to be around a transit station, but does it still, you know, require um, considering transportation access and, and transit access? And that is definitely a part of the legislation. It um, requires looking at how, how folks are going to be getting to and from um, and, and how accessible these areas are. So that is notable. There were a number of other bills, and I, I'll note that you can find a lot of the helpful information from the session and the relevant bills to WFRC in our um, 2024 legislative session wrap-up summary uh, if, you're, if you're interested in knowing a little bit more. We also have our bill tracker and our appropriations tracker, um, which now are comprehensive and, and robust now that the session is over and provide a little bit more detailed information on some of these appropriations and bills. And so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. And if not, Ted or Mayor, I'll turn things back to you. Brenda, thank you. Any questions? Maybe a comment. I, I'm not sure the nature of the GOIO uh, study that was mentioned, but um, but as I looked at it, there is a lot of data that would will come out of the economic study that we're doing currently with Metro Analytics, and I think would give you a good database uh, to enhance whatever work you're doing on that study. And I'll just I'll just note, Miranda mentioned it. It's a GoEO lead, but we will offer to help them, and uh, I anticipate that this is something we will share the details with the Regional Growth Committee and and get some of your thoughts on it. I have a question. House Bill 154, do you have any I That's the bicycle amendments. It didn't pass. So the law said you have to have two hands on the bicycle. Uh, um, and you know, Mayor, I unfortunately, <laughs> I know what bill you're talking about, but unfortunately, I don't have um, any helpful information on maybe what that why that one did not pass, but happy to ask around and see what I can find out for you. I'll get with you later. That's okay, great. Thanks, thanks, Mayor. That was a good one, by the way. I read that. Uh, <clears throat> anything? Anybody other has any more questions? Questions online? Okay. Hearing none and seeing none. Miranda, thank you. Great job. Okay. We now have uh, regional uh, transportation amendments. A uh, couple of actions, particularly the RTP amendment process update, and then action to amend uh, number one. Uh, to the uh, number one to the 2023-2050 RTP. Now the RTP is the transportation element of the Wasatch Choice Vision. The Wasatch Regional Council adopted the plan in its entirety of every four years. But it's a living <clears throat> plan that can be amended to address new considerations. Amending the plan is a collaborative and rig rigorous process for the RGC. Uh, typically cons uh, considers uh, at least once a year. Now today, there are two action items that we talked about that relate to this RTP. First, staff will outline proposed clarifications and modest modifications to the regional transportation plan, amending process of our, for our consideration. And after that, we will review this set of potential projects for amendments. Julie, I think you're going to lead the way on this. Okay, so I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. So, yeah, um, today we have <clears throat> proposing three modifications slash minor modifications slash clarifications um, to our RTP amendment process update. And this is the document that guides um, us as staff and local governments and UDI and UTA as we amend the plan. The um, proposed modifications are outlined in your document as well. Um, so if you want to follow along in there, you could. Okay, so Ted um, briefly explained the process that we go through when we adopt an RTP. We do that, a regional transportation plan before Andrew says anything. Um, we do that every four years and periodically we need to make changes to the plan based on um, changing land use, changing projects, um, funding availability or completed environmental studies. 
but we want to make sure that the projects that are going through that amendment process are held to the same technical rigor as projects that have gone through the four-year planning cycle process. So um, that includes a review of financial constraints, air quality conformity, public input, and we want our process to be transparent. So that's the purpose of the document that we have that outlines um, the various steps that we go through. We have divided um, our RTP amendments into three levels, and those levels are based off of regional significance and project type. And you can see that each level, it might be slightly difficult to read over there, um, hat, includes multiple steps. So today we are recommending changes to, two changes to level one amendments. These are um, staff, or sorry, these are staff modifications of exempt projects. Um, and then these are the most minor, and I'll go through what those projects look like in a second. And then one change to level two, um, board modification amendments and the board being you as the regional growth committee. And these are technically non-exempt regionally significant, uh, sorry, non-exempt non-regionally significant projects. And I'll go through those when we get to the clarification for level two. So the first um, clarification that we're proposing um, is to include amendments that only modify a project's need-based phase within our amendment process. Each project in the Regional Transportation Plan has a needs-based phase, which tells us when a project is needed based on land use changes and technical criteria, and a financially constrained or fiscally constrained phase, which tells us when we're reasonably expecting funding to be available for the construction of that project. Um, it is not federally required that we have needs-based phasing in our plan. It doesn't impact our air quality conformity. It doesn't impact our fiscal constraints and it doesn't impact our technical modeling, but it does allow us as staff and you as um, cities and counties and other agency staff to understand when a project is needed. Um, and it makes those projects um, more eligible for funding and can influence land use changes. So we do include um, needs-based phasing in the plan um, for informational purposes. So like I said, this type of project is not currently in um, our amendment process and we are proposing today to make it a staff modification. Um, and you can see other projects that are like staff modifications are ownership changes, operational projects without signalized intersections, um, active transportation project and land use projects. So uh, the, these are other projects that aren't required to federally be in our plan um, and so that's why we're requiring those or proposing those as level one amendments, staff modifications. The second clarification and both this clarification and the, the third clarification I'll go over um, are specific to wording within the RTP process document and do not change um, the intent of that language and do not change how we've been operating, but is it, so very specific minor change to the language within the document. So bear with me um, while I explain this change. So like I said, level one projects are um, exempt projects and they're pretty minor um, in the nature of, they're not changing the type of the project in the plan. Um, level one amendments require approval by the WFRC executive director and this is in consultation with the interagency consultation team, which is made up of air quality and transportation um, agency staff. Um, it requires a consultation with the Federal Highway Administration and then with the Regional Growth Committee Chair and Vice Chair. Um, we inform the Regional Growth Committee Technical Advisory Committees and you of those changes. Um, but like I said, they're not usually on things that are federally required, nor would change our air quality conformity determination or our fiscal constraint. And so this minor change is that the um, we are clear that this is the process in our procedure section of the amendment process document, but it is slightly unclear in the narrative. And so for the process of being transparent, we are recommending a slight wording change in the narrative section of the plan, which is included in your document if you wanted to see that slight change um, as one of the clarifications we're recommending today. The third clarification, again, to a wording section within the amendment process document, relates to level two amendments. So level two amendments are um, minor collectors and minor arterials. They are quarter preservation, operational projects of signalized intersections, um, non-fixed guideway transit, and uh, core, yeah, quarter preservation of both roadway and transit. So these are technically considered non-regionally significant, um, 
non-exempt, meaning we do need to do an air quality conformity determination, but we do not need to do an emissions analysis. So that is clear in the document in one section, um, but it is not necessarily clear in the procedure. So again, for the sake of being transparent and being clear within the document, we are um, proposing a clarification. Again, this is located in the packets that you reviewed before you got here today. So those are the three minor modifications and clarifications we're proposing. I'm happy to provide any more context um, or a description of those changes for you. Otherwise, um, we do have a motion on the table and this is our proposed language that we make a motion um, for you to direct, sorry, recommend the watch. Yeah, sorry. Um, the motion is that you recommend to the Wasatch Front Regional Council that we can make these minor changes um, as presented and minor technical modifications that might be needed from time to time in consultation with the RGTC chair and vice chair. Okay, <clears throat> before we uh, ask anybody have any questions, uh, Andrew, I think you have a comment, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Julie, thanks for going through that. Um, uh, if that felt rather technical, it's because it is. Thank you for your patience <laughs> as, we, as we go through this. Um, as Julie's noting, the, the methods we use to adopt and then modify the regional transportation plan are important and we have a lot of rigor in it. And then periodically we realize like, oh, well, we use this, this wording in this place in the document and slightly different wording in a different place in the document. And as it stands right now, we have to come back to you and ask you to approve like that, those minor tweaks, which is candidly not the best use of your time. Um, and so what we're suggesting here in this motion is that you would authorize us if there are minor technical modifications as may, may be needed from time to time, that we would be able to do those changes. Um, but importantly, we would have to always consult with the RGC chair and vice chair. So I just wanted to like highlight that to you. The other thing, um, and I had a conversation about this with, with uh, Kevin Cromar, who's a member of the, of the uh, Regional Growth Committee. Um, the, the first proposed change that Julie talked about, which is about needs-based phasing, it's just, it's not reflected in our current processes right now because it doesn't have to be. It's just a good planning process that we utilize at WFRC with our partners about when projects are needed. And as Julie noted, the recommendation that we're making is that those needs-based changes would be so-called level one, that technically they would be done by staff, that we would have the authority to do them. But I wanna make mention two things. One, we always and only could make such amendments first after consulting with the RDC chair and vice chair. Okay, so that's just important to note. And then secondly, and this is already in the policy, I just wanna highlight that a so-called level one change that would not require RGC approval, um, if it made sense to bring it to the, the RGC, then we can do so, okay? Staff can recommend doing that, the RGC chair or vice chair can recommend doing that. And in fact, um, it's in the policy right now that, that uh, those so-called level one amendments could be elevated based on factors including, and I'm reading from the policy, potential impacts, professional judgment, or potential lack of consensus. So the idea here is for these very minor changes to needs-based phasing or identification of needs-based phasing, we would be able to handle those without having an RGC action. But if there was a desire or a value in having a discussion about it, the policy contemplates doing that as well. So I just wanted to, I don't want to dwell too much on it, but I just wanted to be, provide a little additional clarification to what we're talking about here. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Julie. Uh <clears throat> Thanks, Andrew, Andrew, for that. Any comments or questions on what's being proposed? i got a question. Please, Mayor. Uh, so this seems like a really sensible tool to have at your disposal. Um, a lot of times as you're planning, you don't uh, flag some inconsistencies until you go to the, uh, apply the uh, guidelines of the plan and you find there's some inconsistencies. So for minor stuff, but what may be minor to one, side of the table may be major to the other. So in the event that there is a controversy about, let's say elevating a needs base, the staff identifies a need and a, maybe an interested party is like, we don't need that right now. How do you resolve those controversies then under this policy? Do, Julie, do you want to, me to address that or you want, you want to? 
Okay, yeah, that's a great question. Um, the answer is that there isn't a specific answer. And what I mean by that is that sometimes evaluating needs is a rather straightforward um, determination. Um, all the parties are agree. It could be a very minor project. And so then it's very clear. If it's a significant project, or if we know, because we don't, staff, WFRC staff doesn't just do this on our own. So if there was a modification to a project, identification of needs of a project in Sandy City, for example, we would never do that on our own without consulting and working with Sandy City. Well, Andrew, the, every um, amendment that goes through the process has an application requirement. And so it goes through like an application and then we review it. Um, so yeah, like Andrew's saying, we wouldn't just randomly change the needs-based phasing of a project that would be on the request of either a city, the county, or an agency staff member. Okay, and so each one of those is required to... to have a letter of support from, so like if Sandy City staff did it, they would re a requirement from you as the mayor that you would support that project. So and then if there was um, a difference of opinion or potential complexities, Sandy City suggests, we're just using it as an example because you asked the question, Sandy City suggests something and hypothetically UDOT or UTA or the county or somebody else says, wait a second, we need to talk about this more. We're not sure this makes sense. Then that would be the type of thing that could and should be elevated to have more deliberation. Okay. So I, would, is, I think it's great. And I would want the affected parties to be notified, even if there's a min minor change so that there's communication. And so if there's a potential for something minor to be a major impact that staff is not aware or um, city, affected cities are not aware of at the time, so they at least have a chance to consider it in advance of the changes being made. I think this is a great point that the mayor is emphasizing. And I just want to clarify, we do that. That is already part of the process. So that if there are any affected communities or transportation agencies if they were to be affected by a proposed change, we don't make and can't make changes until those parties are consulted. So okay. thank you for emphasizing right. that, and that is part of the process. Right. Very good, thank you. Great questions, Mayor. <clears throat> Anybody else have a question, comments? Anybody online? Okay, seeing none. <clears throat> then we have a motion, okay. Uh, the motion, I think, Julie, you're putting on the table, is, and I'll read it, and then we'll ask to, for a vote on this. The motion is to recommend the Wasatch Front Regional to the Wasatch, excuse me, recommend that the Wasatch Front Regional Council direct Wasatch Front Regional Council staff to update the RTP amendment process as presented and make minor technical and emphasize minor technical modifications as may be needed from time to time in consultation with the RGC <clears throat> chair and vice chair. That's the motion. Do I have a second? With the motion, can we add that there will be the line that all entities will be notified? Just to make sure it's clear. I know that's your guys' operating procedure, but just so then that way, going forward, if something changed, then everybody still knows they're going to be notified. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable request. Okay. okay. So I'll make the motion as stated with the add that any affected entities would be notified of those changes. And we can incorporate that then into what we take to the council next week. Perfect. So now I'll take that as the motion. Yes, I'll okay. second. I'll second. And we have a second. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed, say nay. Hearing none, the motion this approved then, and we'll take this recommendation to next week's uh, regional council. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Okay. <clears throat> Jory, you're going to continue the conversation on the uh, regional transportation. Yes. Um, thank you. I have an item 5B. Uh, Jory Johnner, manager of the Long Range Planning Group uh, here at WFRC. Today, I'll be presenting amendment one, number one uh, to the 2023-2050 Regional Transportation Plan. I'll briefly uh, review the amendment process. We just heard it, but I'll go through that real quick. Provide a high-level overview of the projects in this amendment, 
and then ask that you act on the amendments uh, at two different times during this agenda item. Um, I'll ask that you open up a brief public comment period after I view, review level two projects and then ask for approval of those projects. I will then review the level three projects and ask that you release those projects and the air quality conformity memo to a 30 day public comment period. Um, it should be noted that both of the regional growth committee technical advisory committees primarily made up of your planners um, reviewed all of these project requests at their February 21st meeting and made a unanimous, unanimous recommendation uh, that the RGC approve the level two projects and send the level three projects to a 30 day public comment period. Um, also, as a reminder, um, a complete list of the projects are included in your packet in more detail than what I'll be going through today. So if you'd like those um, additional details, uh, please uh, refer to your packet. I believe there's um, about 10 pages of project descriptions uh, in there. Make sure this is working. Oh, there we go. All right, so uh, as a reminder, the RTP is developed on a four-year cycle. It has a financial plan and is fiscally constrained. It conforms to applicable controls, goals, and budgets on the road mobile sources and ties to your future land uses and the Wasatch Choice vision. The RTP is divided into phases, each about a decade long, both identifying when projects are needed and when funding is expected to be available between now and 2050. The RTP is the starting place for projects to move forward in prioritization of federal, state, and local funds. Periodically, adjustments are needed, as we just discussed, um, in the planning cycle due to things, due to changes in funding availability, changes in local, state, local or state needs, modification to land use, the outcomes of environmental analysis and other studies or updated timelines on development of projects. The amendment process maintains the rigor of the planning process, including review of financial constraints, public input and air quality conformity. Uh, the amendment process for each of the three amendments are outlined on the right side of the slide um, on how the project gets improved, required comments period and air quality determinations. So for level one, the staff modifications, um, again, uh, we'll review those with the chair and vice chair of the regional growth committee and then uh, approval by executive director. Level two bot modifications, board modifications are reviewed by the RGC tax and RGC and then approved during an RGC meeting. And then level three full amendments include new air quality conformity memo, 30 day public, co public comment period, review by the tax, RGC, and final approval by the regional council. Um, all projects are reviewed by the interagency consultation team and the financial constraints are reviewed by federal highways. Um, on the next slide, I'll discuss the project types that fit within these categories. All right, so each amendment include a variety of different types of projects. Most are tied to federal regulation and requirements guiding our project classification on this slide. So the level one projects include ownership changes, operational changes to roadway, modifications to needs based phasing, all active transportation changes and changes to the Wasatch Choice Vision Centers. Level two include collectors, minor arterial roadway changes, non-fixed guideway transit projects and changes to corridor preservation, while level three full amendments are for principal arterials, freeways and fixed guideway transit. Um, I'm going to first provide you a brief highlight of the projects and then review each project in detail. So um, within amendment number one, we have a total of 37 projects um, spanning all transportation modes, 12 level one requests from UDOT local communities and UTA consisting of nine active transportation and three transit projects. Um, due to the, the need to update the process that we just discussed in the previous item, um, the regional after the regional council meeting next week, um, projects will be coordinated with Mayor Dandoy and Commissioner Kamalu, uh, and then considered for approval by Andrew. So when we get through these, we'll, we won't take action on level ones until following next week's meeting. There's 12 level two pro requests from local communities, UTA and UDOT, <clears throat> and are made up of nine roadway and three transit projects. Um, after reviewing these projects, again, um, we'll open up the agenda item to a public comment and then ask for approval of these projects at this meeting today. And then finally, 13 level three projects from Farmington City, UDOT and UTA um, are made up of three transit and nine roadway projects. 
Um, after reviewing those, um, we'll ask for a motion uh, to send these uh, projects and the air quality conformity memo number 42, um, and then bring back those comments to you in May, and then finally ask for approval by the council at the May meeting. First, um, per our RTP amendment process, we prepared a set of technical considerations. Um, I wanted to move this up. Usually we put this at the end. I wanted to put this out in front of you before running through the list of projects. Um, there are a set of technical considerations that are uh, similar to the uh, considerations used in developing the 2023 to 2050 RTP and tie directly to the Wasatch Choice Vision goals. Um, so I'll briefly cover these on the next slide before reviewing the individual projects. Um, so to maintain the robustness of the planning process, every amendment uh, is a, or project within an amendment is subject to technical considerations. Um, since most of these projects in this amendment are regional in scale, um, we're gonna report these considerations on a countywide level, uh, which you can see on the slide here. Um, the projects presented in this amendment will provide both more and safer connectivity by increasing our active transportation networks, providing more connectivity across barriers like railroads and highways, uh, improve our transit connectivity, connectivity and improve access to the Wasatch Choice Centers. Um, for vehicle hours of travel and access to opportunity, um, we are only showing the benefits in phase one of the RTP. Uh, these numbers on the slide are shown in comparison between our existing RTP and this amendment. Um, through the new connections and increased uh, capacity, we've increased or we will increase with this amendment um, access to jobs and education in all four counties. Um, however, there will be a slight uh, increase in the vehicle hours of travel, uh, about 2% increase in Davis County and less than a half a percent in Salt Lake County. Um, so they're there, and if you want to refer to this later, they'll be in the presentation we post online. All right, so level one projects. Jory. Yes. I think Mayor Stanger. Oh, yes. On your prior slide, there was two different colors. So like when you go back to number one, oh, what is yeah. the difference between the blue and the gray for each of these different slides? Transit and roadway. So they're, they're divided by, um, let me see here, clicking both buttons. Um, the yellow here in level one are active transportation. The blue ones are transit for level two. Uh, the gray is uh, roadway, blue transit, and then blue transit, gray. So it, it was just to help kind of split out. I wasn't sure if some were on the list, some didn't make the list or were next up or. <laughs> no, no, we were just trying to show that the, the difference in categories as I was given the, the high level overview, but thank you for the question. All right, level one requests. Um, gonna cover these real quickly. Um, and then after I get, so the, the game plan here is, is I don't wanna run through all 37 projects with you and then have you ask questions 25 slides from before, right? So I'm gonna run through level one projects. We'll stop there, see if there's any questions, comments, discussions, then move on to the level two projects. We'll cover those 12 projects. And then finally uh, take that motion, then move to level three. So. Hopefully that helps uh, break this, this presentation up a little bit. So first project, um, WFRC and UDOT have an overlapping project in our RTP and the state's long range plan uh, for Weber, for the Weber Canyon bike path, uh, Weber Canyon bike path. Um, removing this project from the RTP cleans up the statewide unified transportation plan. And just to wanna be clear on this, we're, going to re we're recommending removing this project from the WFRC RTP, but it's gonna still remain in the UDOT's long range plan. So this would be going a bike path parallel uh, to I-84 going up Weber Canyon. Um, for Porter Lane- Can I bike do a quick interjection there? So this is partly about the boundary of WFRC and the work that we do versus the boundary that UDOT. It's not that we have competing plans in the same area. Right. It's when we've got these edge conditions of a project that goes between where we have jurisdiction versus UDOT. And, and technically this one, it would be split in half, but we've came to an agreement with UDOT that the full project would remain in UDOT's plan and we'd take it out of ours. Similarly in Ogden Canyon, as an example, the WFRC plan will keep the entire 
uh, trail project, UDOT wouldn't, didn't put that in there, but it split about halfway. Um, okay, Porter Rockwell well bike lane. Um, the request modifies the Eastern extent, um, which extended to I-15 where there was a planned crossing. Um, the I-15 environmental impact statement has moved the planned crossing just to the North. Um, so it pretty much dead ends this project. We wanna make sure it has a logical termini. Um, and that logical endpoint would be at 1250 uh, West, uh, 1250 West shared use path. So it's just moving the, the project uh, extent a little bit farther to the West. Um, Salt Lake County recently completed a feasibility study on the Bonneville shoreline uh, trail in the Ochre foothills. Um, this amendment reflects the latest alignment coming from that study. Um, as you can see on the slide, the gaps you see here um, indicate areas of the trail that are complete. Um, want to make a quick note that the Bonneville Shoreline Trail is the only soft surface trail on the RTP. Um, we've included it in the plan um, due to its regional reach from Box all the, all the way from Box Elder County into Salt Lake County. So and we thought it made sense. Everybody knows Bonneville Shoreline. A lot of people don't know that it's on the um, west side also uh, in the Oakers. Mayor knows. Um, the Perry Farm Overhead Crossing Amendment is a phase change from phase one to phase, phase two to phase one um, due to the project receiving funding uh, to Bluffdale from the Federal Railroad Administration. Um, I-15 uh, Farming to the Salt Lake Environmental Impact Statement uh, impacts several uh, existing active transportation projects in the RTP as well as, as, well as adding new projects there are a total of 11 changes associated um, from the environmental study, seven of which are modifications and four are new projects. Um, most notable projects are bike ped crossings of I-15 that do not require passing through an interchange, uh, which increases users' comfort and safety. Um, these projects are planned to be built with the I-15 uh, widening and reconstruction. And uh, within your packets, um, there is a link, and if you reference this spread, this PowerPoint later, there's a link to a spreadsheet with a list of all those projects in detail, but you can see them on the map here as well. Uh, Kearns, Township, Kearns Township recently um, completed their local active transportation plan. After working with the community, four projects from the plan are being requested for inclusion as part of the RTP, three shared use paths, one buffer bike lane, all in various phases of the plan. Again, a link in your packets uh, uh, is available for those details of the project. Leighton City recent, recently completed their active transportation plan. Uh, 36 projects from that plan are being requested for inclusion in the RTP. 16 improved crossings, um, four of which are on the existing Denver Rio Grande Western uh, Trail. Um, link within your packet for that uh, list as well. Taylorsville recently completed a local active communities plan. 17 projects from that are being requested inclusion into the RTP, uh, include several shared use paths and an undercrossing of I-215 uh, there in Taylorsville. White City Township rec recently completed a unique local walking plan. Uh, three projects are being uh, requested for inclusion in the RTP, including grade separated crossings of the White City Canal Trail at about 106 South. The next three projects are needs-based phasing changes. Um, and so I'll run through those. Um, and that's part of the reason why we uh, had the amendment item before. Um, one was that to add the need-based phasing. First project is 400 West, the American Spur track extension um, is requesting needs-based phasing change from phase two to phase one. This would allow the project to pursue funding. Um, but to be clear, if funding becomes available or is awarded, the project would need to be to come back for an amendment to, to uh, change the fiscally constrained phase of the project. Um, the tracks orange line from the University of Utah to downtown Salt Lake, uh, also requesting a needs-based uh, phasing change from phase two to phase one, um, allow for future funding uh, pursuit. And same thing, if funding uh, becomes available, we'll need to move the financial constraint uh, phase of this project into phase one. And then uh, the other half of this project from downtown Salt Lake to the airport on the, the track orange, tracks orange line, um, requesting phase change 
uh, needs-based phase changing from phase three to phase one. Um, same considerations um, if funding becomes available. So um, that concludes level one projects. So there's your first 12. Any questions or comments, discussions from RGC? Mayor, we use your mic, please. <laughs> I used to being so technologically advanced in these meetings. We just want to hear what you have to say. For all of the costs, are those then that the WFRC are paying or that's just the total cost? Those, all, most all of these costs are planning level costs um, or if there's a refined cost, uh, most of the projects do not have funding um, that we're looking uh, to put in here. Some of them do, um, the, cross, the crossing in uh, Bluffdale, um, has some fund, federal highway or federal railroad administration funding. I-15 has uh, some funding for it, um, things like that. But yeah, not all of the projects here. And just a reminder, these are in today's dollars. So 2023 costs, not in the future phased costs. And so um, as we know, they're, they're more expensive in the year of expenditure. Thank you. Jory, just on the transit items, uh, we would, pursue discretionary federal grants uh, for some of those. We might uh, even um, approach the TTIF fund or, or uh, some local dollars, but they're not, it's currently being studied, but there's no uh, construction dollars accounted for at this point. I'll also supplement, Mayor, just as a reminder for RGC, an action related to the regional transportation plan is a planning action, it's not a funding action. So the steps that we take here to um, adopt or modify as we're doing here, amend the RTP is, is a recognition that, that collectively we think this makes sense from a planning perspective. There are additional steps that are needed um, to actually get funding. That's programming, prioritization. And to your question, Mayor Stanger, funding sources can come some through WFRC, UDOT, UTA, cities and counties, federal funds, you know, so it just gets it in the plan where it should be, and then it sets it up to move forward potentially to actually be funded. And I think that's a great point, uh, Andrew. Uh, certainly I have my concerns when we move projects from phase two to phase one, phase three to phase one. Uh, and I guess maybe uh, as we're looking from a planning perspective, Jory, could we talk a little bit about then once it gets approved, go into a phase one, there's already programs that are in phase one. How do you see that now interacting? Does some of those get pushed to the top? Do they basically just follow in line? Uh, because some of us who've been working phase one projects uh, would certainly like to see those fulfilled, recognizing that what we're talking about here is putting more into that same, that timeline. And so I, I really would think I'd surely like to make sure the ones that's been there for a while try to get completed. So they're all gonna be competing against the same funding. And so uh, how do you see that process working now that if we move these into from a phase two and a phase three into phase one, how do you see that now kind of laying out in terms of priority or at least a funding process? It, what it does is it, I, it doesn't change what's already been programmed. So our transportation improvement program uh, is there's funding programmed out six years, right? Four years of programming, two years of concept development. The state has a prioritization process and have programmed out, for instance, the transportation investment fund um, out to about 2029 or 2030. I believe they're discussing it now and tomorrow of um, programming additional funds. Those projects that have funding stay, stay with funding. No, nothing jumps ahead of those. What, what it does is if by moving projects to the needs-based phase one or a project financially constrained even within our plan to phase one, makes them eligible to pursue, and in a lot of cases, um, easier to, to, to be part of a prioritization process. Um, part of the, the state's prioritization process, um, consider all projects that are financially constrained, um, and I believe needs-based phasing. Local communities or districts, transit agencies can request projects that aren't in phase one to be considered, and that, and that at the commission's discretion to consider those. I know projects sometimes get submitted that are not in phase one to our transportation improvement program. Um, and you know they, they go through the process and evaluation and if they are selected, then we'll make a formal request to move those forward. But 
a lot of times it's been vetted and the phase one projects are at the top of the list already as they we've tried to align our RTP evaluations to the funding sources of the state and of our own federal programs and even the local um, county and city, you know, funding sources. So we've tried to align the processes. So there's, you know, there's some uniformity there um, in project selection and evaluations. Andrea, did, do you have anything you want to add on that one? Um, I, I think Jory uh, summarized it pretty well. I think um, in terms of capacity project prioritization for TIF funds and TTIF funds, having a project identified Certainly as a phase one fiscally constrained project, it's automatically on a list to be considered for funding. Have it, having it identified as a phase one need streamlines the ability to get it on the list to be considered. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's one of the critical pieces of that, of that needs-based uh, phasing. Yeah, great, uh, great answers. Uh, Mayor Stanger, your comment. So with the change for this one you have on the screen, looking at the map, it almost seems that's pretty much the existing route that it takes. It is, uh, but uh, what you would have uh, with an additional line is you'd have to buy additional car sets, uh, and it would it may require some other uh, you know inline modifications uh, to accommodate um, uh, the route, but. Most of the infrastructure cost is there, but though, but take in mind that a car, a Trax car, is about uh, I think it's between six and ten million dollars a car, so it's not an inexpensive proposition because uh, you can't just use the same cars; they're already programmed into the current frequency. So if you had a second service, you would basically have to double your cars. And I'll, I'll just add on to this, the, the intent of this project, so that we did a future light rail um, study. And this is really, the, the intent of this is really to, to take from the orange line going from the international airport. There was another one that was right before this that went from the, uh, went from the, there we go, from the uh, U of U to downtown. That is essentially the orange line. So it would basically take the orange line from the airport all the way up to the research park. So that's the intent of this is like additional tracks that would run directly from the airport to research park. I, I'd note also this project capital cost improvements, the cars, $100 million, um, 10 million of operating um, for it. And then the next project, uh, only 30 million and seven and a half to build the, the light rail. If you were to build it from the U of U to the airport would be a lot higher than that. So this is just enhancing it. And there's a, a few sections I think that would need to be um, put in between with the, with the additional uh, fleet. Okay, hey, great questions, uh, <clears throat> great comments. Thank you. Uh, the reason for my comment, and just so you can understand uh, from a, from a um, uh, outside, maybe from the influence of what's about to take place, uh, certainly Utah's excited about what's a decision coming in terms of the Olympics. Um, it's going to change the landscape, in my opinion, okay, of again, much like the 2002 did. In that phase one, okay, there's going to be some modifications, some chainings, probably some very healthy planning as we prepare for that, because it's a, it's a big thing, as you well know, along the Swasatch Front recognizing that there are going to be, in my opinion, other priorities are going to be put on the table, okay, to move them out of phase two, maybe into phase one, or even create new demands. There's going to be high priority needs as the decision comes forward, because I'm thinking since the phase one runs between now and 2032, if we're going to make some ma major modifications in terms of transportation on multiple levels uh, to prepare for what we hope is going to be the decision for a 2034, then we've got to get some things done within that phase one timeline. And in my mind's eye, other opportunities are going to come in to help us in that planning and more priorities are going to be needed. So I just think it was clear, Jordan, you did a good job. And, and thank you for sharing that because I needed to make sure I understood that, that there is a process. The things that we're planning and are funded will move forward. 
but certainly we need to get those other projects into the planning phase so that as they come on board and the need drives to get, in essence, Salt Lake and certainly Salt Lake County ready, uh, and we'll see the same thing in the other county areas, that those projects are going to get in there and we're going to get some attention to those planning requirements as we prepare for 2034. So um, great answers. Okay. Certainly understand it now better how the process works. Thank you, Jory. All right. Level two. Um, briefly going to run through these projects like I did with the level one. Um, we'll open it up for comment around the table um, with the regional growth committee members, then ask for a brief public comment period. So we'll formally uh, do that and then motion for approval of these uh, level two projects. So uh, let's jump in uh, here. Um, 126 South in Harriman. This, is a, this amendment will align the 126 South uh, State Environmental Study and SES um, with the RTP. The current project in the RTP has the entire project as three lanes. The SES recommended that the easternmost portion from about 6,800 West to 7,300 West be five lanes. Um, and then the Western portion from 7,300 West out to Bacchus Highway uh, remain as three lanes. So we just wanna modify uh, a small section of this um, to be consistent with the environmental study. Freedom Point Way um, will connect Porter Rockwell Boulevard to the Pony Express Road um, by exp extending the current roadway. Uh, Bluffdale is interested in pursuing corridor preservation front funds from Salt Lake County for this project. Uh, Granville Avenue will extend will be extended to reach uh, Old Bingham Highway, which will provide more accessibility to 5600 West Old Bingham Highway track station and, and allow for better overall street connectivity. Um, UTA has identified multiple grade separated crossings in their front runner forward study. Um, this will help increase safety of the vehicles and pedestrians and help with the reliability of front runner. Um, the first recommendation here on this slide is, foot, is Hillfield Road in Layton. Um, I'll cover the other five projects in the following slides. Should be noted that um, WFRC staff has met with all the local communities to discuss these crossings and confirm the merits and desires for inclusion into the RTP. Uh, Next, the next project um, is a Gordon Avenue crossing in Layton um, over both the Union Pacific Railroad and the Front Runner Line. Pages Lane, um, grade separation is just west of I-15 in West Bountiful. Uh, 1700 South grade separation crossing um, in Salt Lake City, just west of I-15 for that project. Uh, Vine Street in Murray is um, just adjacent to the Murray Front Runner Station um, and east of I-15. And then finally, uh, 5900 South Crossing um, is also in Murray, uh, located just to the east of I-15. So all those projects were, were packaged, but they're individual pro there'll be individual projects um, in the RTP. Hey, Rory, what is grade separation? Can you explain that? Because I noticed they all have the same amount. So is that like a yeah, standard that's package? Yeah, that's a planning. The, the amount we put in there is planning level amount that we have in our planning process. Um, grade separation could be an overpass or an underpass, um, depending on the, the, the uh, topography of the, the surrounding area. I'm guessing most of these would be um, local road going up and over Front Runner, where right now there's a at-grade crossing with the arms that go down. Um, and this just helps again with safety of vehicles, pedestrians and bikes getting over. They don't have to wait at the crossings and it helps with re reliability of the front runner. Um, there's often gate issues and some things like that or cars on the, on the it, track. It eliminates, uh, you know, the gates and also in, in keeps the speed up between stations uh, if you're not having to slow down through certain segments, so. Does it separate, so it separates the pedestrians because we've had um, two fat tracks fatalities in Sandy in the past year and a half or so. So I'm sure it would be a big safety improvement. Yeah, we would assume that these crossings would include um, the active transportation components um, at minimum sidewalks and if in some cases um, a bike path up and over them as well. And, and again, we put, I think, $32 million in there is our planning level cost for an overpass. Um, some of them will be more expensive. Some of them could be a little bit cheaper, um, but this is, gets them on the plan right now. And then those projects, UTA working with the local communities can work to 
pursue funding for them. Great, thanks, Hori. Um, Davis Salt Lake City Community Connector. Um, this is an alignment change um, to the Davis Salt Lake Community Connector uh, environmental study. Um, we'll adjust it from 400 West to 300 West from about Beck Street to North Temple Front Runner Station um, per the environmental analysis. So the environmental analysis is done, make this amendment, and then um, they can work to get their record of decision for this project, um, the core route from Farmington to the University of Utah Research Center. Um, this is a new bus, uh, core bus route service uh, or recommendation for a new core bus route service in Big Cottonwood Canyon that would go from the Cottonwood Canyon Transit Hub at the mouth of the canyon up to the Brighton Ski Resort. Resort. Uh, the results of the UDOT-led um, Big Cottonwood Canyon study recommended this alignment. Um, it should be noted that the construction and operator um, are still to be determined, um, similar to the, the Little Cottonwood Canyon operations. And uh, the point, uh, this is the, the final project, uh, the Point innovative, innovative Mobility Zone with dedicated shuttles is a new project and it is the first phase of the Point of the Mountain Environmental Assessment Transit recommendation, which was led by UDOT. Um, the serve, I'll, I'll talk about another project, but it falls within the level three category. It'll be the top of the list of the next one. Um, the service area for this is not totally defined at this point, um, it won't be that exact circle with those weird lines across, um, joking. Um, but there's a desire to have the dedicated shuttle or an on-demand service for the point, um, point of the mountain development area as it um, grows and uh, businesses and, and people locate there. So that concludes the level two project overview. Uh, any comments, discussion from the group here? I don't believe we have any comments. Anybody online <clears throat> have a comment before we go for a motion? Nope, it doesn't look like it. Okay, proceed, Jory. All right, so uh, Mayor Dandoy, both, as a reminder, both Regional Growth Committee Technical Advisory Committees um, reviewed these projects at their February 21st meeting and recommended that the Regional Growth Committee approve the level two projects. Um, so I'd recommend that we open up to an official public comment period right now um, and then following that uh, comment period, pending any final questions and discussions, if any come up, uh, entertain a suggested motion on the screen. Okay, thank you, Joy. <clears throat> so with that, we then like to open up a public comments. Anybody like to share a thought? Anybody online? Mayor, there don't appear to be any, and it's no members of the public online who are seeking to comment either, right, Andrea? Okay. Okay, no public comments then. Do I have a motion then to approve level two board modifications for amendments number one to the 2023 to 2050 RTP? I'll make that motion, Mr. Chair. So moved. Thank you, Mayor. Do I have a second? Okay, we have a, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Do we have any opposed? Say nay. Okay, the motion approves. Jory, thank you. Let's move on. All right, two thirds of the way through. Okay, um, 13 level three projects, eight of which are captured in the I-15 uh, Farmington to Salt Lake EIS. Um, like to open it up for any questions or comment. And then again, ask for releasing the uh, projects in the air quality conformity to a 30 day public comment period. All right, so the second half of the Point of the Mountain projects, um, the Point of the Mountain Transit Amendment includes an updated mode and alignment of the bus rapid transit um, project that's currently there to a light rail per the Point of the Mountain Environmental Assessment led by UDOT. Um, the light rail project is recommended to be in fiscally constrained phase two of the RTP matching the recommendations from the environmental study. The BRT project uh, in the current plan is in phase one. Um, and uh, as you can see on the screen here, the alignment shift is just uh, shifted slightly to accommodate the change from a bus rapid transit to a light rail um, line. A new point of the mountain front runner station. Um, 
associated with the strategic double tracking from Draper to Lehigh. Um, funding has been identified for this project by the Utah legislature, um, is being requested to be added to the regional transportation plan. Um, the cost on this slide is for the station and the associated double tracking in the WFRC area. Um, the total cost is estimated to be about $400 million. Um, and the remainder of that project um, is, is uh, going to be amended into the Mountain Land Association of Governments uh, Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, the next two projects come from uh, the Farmington Station Area Plan. Um, a new stop station or terminal um, would require further study, um, but it will connect uh, and it will connect to the planned fixed guideway innovative mobility zone project that connects to Farmington Front Runner Station. So they're looking to do an IMZ up uh, in that area. Um, the second half of the project um, is a fixed guideway project connecting um, this project before the station stop or terminal to the Farmington Front Runner Station. Um, I-15 Farmington to Salt Lake City, the environmental impact state, uh, statement has recently been completed and recommends five general purpose lanes and a high occupancy toll lane um, this will be updated from the four general purpose and two HOT lanes currently in the RTP. Uh, the I-15 project will also create improved interchanges with multiple safety features for pedestrian and bicycle use, including some of the amendments noted early in the level one uh, summary. The overall project will be adjusted to comprise of three segments. So uh, from Farmington to 2600 South in Bountiful, 2600 South to the Salt Lake County line, and then from the Davis County line to 400 South in Salt Lake City. Um, by doing this, those three projects, we're looking to encapsulate all the, the improvements to the I-15 project. Um, in the current plan, there are five existing um, projects um, and we're recommending those projects as standalone projects be removed because they're gonna be built as one, um, the plan is to build it as one project instead of piecemealing it. Um, so those projects include the I-15 managed motorways, uh, project RD-44, Parish Lane uh, Interchange RD-72. Um, there are two I-215 interchange upgrades. It was planned to be built in two different phases, um, RD-78 and 79, and then the Warm Springs Road Interchange RS-217. All those projects are part of the overall I-15 and a lot more uh, projects. I think there were 20 some odd projects we'd have to to individually put in here, um, but we're putting it into those three projects. Again, the segments, uh, two in Davis and one in Salt Lake County. And then the final project of level three is a project on I-15 in Box Elder County uh, that will add two miles of passing lanes in both directions, both north and southbound, uh, will help traffic efficiency and include safety, especially related to heavy truck traffic in the area. Um, so that uh, concludes the level three projects. Are there any questions on these uh, 13 projects or six different slides? Uh, this is Reed Ewing. I, I, it'd be almost malpractice if I didn't mention this. Uh, it's something that won't surprise Andrew or Ted or Jory, uh, but uh, with capacity projects in the I-15 uh, improvements do include capacity projects, uh, adding capacity. We have a, uh, a phenomenon called induced travel or induced uh, VMT, vehicle miles traveled, uh, which was in 1995 debated uh, by transportation experts, just how significant induced travel is. You build it and they will come phenomenon. Uh, it's no longer controversial. Uh, there's been a lot of research. We've done some of it ourselves at the U of U. Uh, if you uh, expand capacity, it fills up. Uh, if there's uh, congestion to begin with. And what happens is vehicle miles traveled in the region increase, which means that 
you 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 have more greenhouse gas emissions, more categorical uh, uh, pollutant emissions, uh, more uh, traffic fatalities, serious injuries, and I could go on. In the short term, uh, you have more trip making, longer trips, et cetera. In the long term, it actually causes sprawl, sprawl development. Um, this is not a theory uh, that I'm making up. This is a, a phenomenon that occurs. And um, as a member of this committee for, I don't know, 12 years or however long I've been here, uh, I've raised this issue. And uh, I have not, when we've been voting on individual amendments, I've not had anyone share the concern. So I was often the only no vote, which is frankly embarrassing. But I feel so strongly about it that I'm, I'm bringing it up here. Uh, I, if anyone wants to debate the phenomenon, uh, I'm, I'm happy to do it. But it, it is a, a, a reality. Uh, you do not solve in the short term. If you if you widen rain, uh, lanes on a on I fifteen, you will have less congestion, and VHT may not go up much. In the long term, you have uh, these negative effects associated with increased VMT. So uh, I will. I, I wish we'd break out the capacity projects from the safety projects which don't raise the issue of induced traffic. I wish we would uh, focus more on our uh, regional growth uh, plan uh, and uh, distinguish those projects which serve centers from those which do not primarily serve centers because I can in my mind, make a distinction between those. We want the centers to thrive, but we don't want suburban sprawl. And we don't want increased VMT. So I'm raising that issue. That'll account for some of my no votes. If we'd break out the capacity projects, I'd be voting yes for the safety projects, yes for the ones that serve our, our growth centers, uh, and no for those that will primarily induce sprawl, urban sprawl. So I've made my point. I won't make it again. Um, I've been making it for 12 years. And uh, with that, I will conclude. And Mr. Chair? Yes, go ahead. Yes, this is Laureen Kamalu. And I'm, uh, you know, grateful for any any feedback. Obviously, this is some very educated um, background here from the speaker. Sorry, I didn't catch your name. Uh, you could say your name, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> Reed Ewing, I'm a, a professor at the University and City and Metropolitan Planning in my primary areas of expertise are transportation and land use. Yeah. So, and I'm, you know, just from a policy perspective, always there is a trade-off and, and I'm, I'm, you're absolutely not advocating for do nothing. I just am so curious um, because we just barely had the West Davis highway open up here. I mean, we've, we've had here huge problems in Davis County with the constraint of two highways. Now this is a third highway and you're right. It's, it's pretty peaceful right now on that third highway and it's helping a lot of folks have a shorter commute. I don't, I don't disagree that if you build it, they will come. However, we have a whole bunch more growth coming, you know, not really our growth in Davis County is not nearly so much as the growth will be filled up. We'll be the first County filled in of all 29 counties, but there's growth in Morgan, there's growth in Weber, there's growth in Box Elder, there's growth South of us, you know, and I just, I, the alternative is what, you know, <laughs> we, they built, they built a third because of all the data and, and 
supposedly a tremendous need for it. And I don't disagree with that. So I'm, I'm just curious to know what, what you view as the trade-off of not doing some of these things. Well, what we, what we know from places like, and I, I know I use Portland too often as an example, but Portland was going to build freeways and decided instead to put its money into uh, transit. I'm talking about the West Side Max Line, the East Side Max Line, um, put money into transit. I, I didn't object to the level two projects. We know that these smaller projects actually sometimes reduce VMT by providing greater street connectivity. Um, the West Davis Highway, Freeway, whatever you want to call it, uh, is sprawl inducing. So you're, you're right, there will be a lot of development along it, but uh, it would not have occurred to nearly the same degree. And I'm basing this not on some theoretical whatever, but it would not have occurred or will not have occurred uh, if we hadn't built the road. So uh, there, there are lawsuits around the country. I don't know if I've ever mentioned that to you, Andrew and Ted, uh, but challenging these capacity improvements and some of the lawsuits have been, have been successful. And it's just not a, a concern for the Regional Growth Committee, but it is a concern of mine. So um, I felt as though I should raise it this one time. And um, I don't expect others to necessarily, I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, we're growing. We're the fastest growing state in the country, right? But uh, what, what happens if you don't uh, provide capacity is that you have less uh, traffic in total. And the relief you get in the short term by building capacity, you lose in the long term. And I know it's, this is a tricky thing. I mean, you know, I, I, I can see the arguments on both sides but it's something we should do with full knowledge that in, induced traffic or induced congestion will occur. Thank you, Reed. And I, it sounds to me then, and with your good follow-up explanation, you like for there to be some constraint on the sprawl, the growth of vehicle miles, that, that by not doing some of these things, it, it acts as a constraint then sounds like yes it, it is a constraint that's exactly what it is and and you know regions all over the country are dealing with this exact same issue um because they're growing and because there's congestion but the west davis highway i don't know if i ever had a chance to vote on that individually i must have missed that meeting but uh i would have strongly opposed it uh, had I uh, been involved in the conversation at that time. Um, uh, Ari and, and uh, Ryan and uh, you know, other, other planners are aware of this phenomenon, but we just don't seem to uh, factor it into our decision-making. And maybe 90% of the level three projects uh, will be justified and 100% of the level two projects will be, but uh, capacity projects, particularly those that don't specifically serve centers, which we're trying to uh, encourage, uh, should raise these concerns in people's minds. And uh, I don't mind too much being the only no vote. I just wish we'd separate out the projects which are sprawl inducing from those which uh, improve safety or which serve centers or whatever. Thank you. Professor, 
Yeah, Professor Ewing, thank you for your input and Commissioner, uh, great comments. Um, Jory, you've got more to do. We got to get into this, but may I make a point? One of the great things about the Regional Growth Committee is we look at transportation from multiple levels. Certainly when you look at the capacity issues on our interstates, uh, interstate freeways, highways, there's there, we're looking at local roads, uh, uh, millions of dollars, if not billions, trying to address the, the front runner station and, and connectivity of that. And then you look at the, what's happening uh, with our active transportation. We are hitting this transportation issue from so many levels to try to build the capacity. And, and I think as long as we continue and not focus on just one element, but certainly look at all elements, then I think we can bring a much more balanced approach, if you will, in terms of how we deal with this demand. And, and I'll be blunt in is my perspective, being one of the fastest growing business in the state, the state in the country, I am telling you, uh, Growth is an interesting thing, and if you if you read the numbers, and I do try to listen to what the Ken C. Gardner Institute is pointing out, uh, most most of the growth we're taking in in people are often coming now from outside of us. We were one of the fastest growing uh, cities in terms of our children and our grandchildren, but now because of the growth that's happening, and we're bringing people from outside in here, it's hard for us to balance all this when in fact uh, we have to balance this to do with the growth and not have transportation options. So uh, again, I think the Regional Growth Committee is doing a good job balancing all of these requirements in this vi very dynamic world we're living in in Utah. And uh, some would say it's a great place to live. So anyway, you have more it's you'd like great... to share? Trump, you have a comment. Yeah, yeah. Well, one, la one last comment, then I'll shut up. But... Um... We've, in our research, distinguished population growth from induced travel. So their uh, population growth occurs, it increases traffic. What's unique or different about induced traffic is that it's the highway improvement itself which causes people to make longer trips, more trips, and so on. Not not the population growth, which is going to occur, uh, but those regions which have chosen, like Portland, to put more of their uh, money into alternatives. And I love level one and like level two uh, have found that VMT doesn't grow as fast. And I wrote a book called Growing Cooler uh, in 2007 uh, on planning, urban planning uh, and greenhouse gas emissions. And each mile you drive in your gas powered car uh, produces about a pound of CO2. So if you add a million, uh, you know, VMT, you're gonna get a million more CO2 uh, uh, emissions and uh, that problem of, of climate change in my mind is the major challenge to us not not just the vehicle manufacturers you know getting their emissions down and so on but we as planners need to always consider uh, uh, climate change when we make decisions and um, what would happen if we didn't do these improvements is there would be more congestion, but less VMT. What you, when you make it possible to go faster uh, in a car, you make it possible for people to go farther in a car. And that's exactly what they do. Okay. Well, thank and th you, thank you for, for putting up you. with that long explanation. I appreciate your input. Thank you. Uh, Carlton, you have a comment, and then we have uh, hands. Uh, yeah, just just the... a real quick comment. Uh, uh, to the I-15 uh, configuration, UDOT has worked with us in making sure that any expansion or construction of infrastructure accommodates both our right-of-way as well as what they're contemplating. And so uh, to the credit of you know any vested parties, we've tried to 
take advantage of these opportunities so the disruption only happens once. Yeah, great comment. And Kevin, I believe you have your hands up, please. Yeah, thank you. Could we go back really quickly to the point of the mountain transit project? Yes. Yeah, so previous, the recommendation, like it was explained, was to use bus rapid transit. Here we're making the change. We would be switching it from BRT to, to light rail. And, you know, there was a great study that was released in December of 2023 that um, really outlined all those considerations and rationales. As I went through that report and went through the appendices, uh, without considering costs, just looking at the performance of the two options, I think it's pretty close to a toss up. You know, the, the light rail performs probably a little better at the north end. Uh, BRT performs a little bit better at the south end, all things considered. Um, and then once you do factor in costs, BRT is much less expensive. I mean, um, the, the, when you do just cost basis, BRT is preferable. Um, for, for today, we're just sending it out for public comment. Um, I learned a long time ago from experience that even if you have a concern with the project, it's great to send out for public comment, see what other people have to say before bringing it back. But I just wanted to mention that I, I don't know if this is actually a good change. I think BRT might be the better option, um, but I still think we should send it for public comment and maybe make that decision um, when we hear back from, from everyone else. But I just wanted to make that point before we moved on here. Yeah, great comment. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, Jory, would you like to- uh... Kevin, I, I would also add that um, I believe the point of the mountain environmental assessment um, is planning to go out for public comment uh, here shortly as well. So there'll be a, a twofer on the comments, one for changing in our plan, and then they'll also um, be looking for comments. Andrew? Or, uh, no? Okay. Okay. All right, let me get back to where we were. Oh, there we go. All right. Um, so again, reminder, Regional Growth Committee tax um, reviewed these projects uh, roughly a month ago at the February 21st, 21st meeting. They recommend um, that these projects go out to um, a 30 day public comment period um, for the level three projects and the air quality conformity memorandum number 42. Um, so on the screen for your convenience, we put a, and in your packets, a draft motion um, pending any further conversation. Perfect, thank you. <clears throat> This is a level three recommendation to the Wasatch Regional Council, which I believe will take up next week or will take up after the 30 day public input period. Pro process is, and I, I'll skip to the next slide real quick. Um, Regional Growth Committee reviews the uh, these projects in level three. You can see on the right side there. Right. Um, we'll also send out uh, the, the list of projects to the uh, Council of Governments so that all the elected okay. officials within Box Elder, Davis, and Salt Lake County, projects that they're, they're the counties that have uh, amendment recommendations in each of those counties. Um, and we'll collect the comments from the public comment period um, out to April uh, 23rd, I believe. Um, after that, at the May Regional Growth mm -hmm. Committee, we'll report back any comments we received in that comment period, um, let you all discuss um, further discuss the comments um, and then ask for a motion at the May Regional Growth Committee that the council okay. the following week in May approve the amendment. So Perfect. Um, we'll have a, a I just want to make sure that so. was clear. Okay. Yeah. So could you go back then? Perfect. Okay. Any other comments or questions relative to uh, this level three? Now I have one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have two things. First, is um, Mayor uh, Jenny Wilson is a member of this committee. She's not able to be here today, but she did um, ask me to share a comment with you. And actually this comment is comes from her consultation with Salt Lake City. Um, and so I'm just gonna read this to you, what she gave to me, uh, it's brief. Uh, Salt Lake City has already articulated our thoughts and concerns on the record and does not support adding lanes to I-15. But Salt Lake City does appreciate how UDOT has made a concerted effort to work with us to not expand the I-15 footprint through residential areas in SLC, in Salt Lake City, and to improve the design of 600 North to make it safer for all users, among other things. Salt Lake City looks forward to continuing the conversation of healing the East-West divide with UDOT 
as part of the upcoming study funded through the Reconnecting Communities Grant. So that, that's the entirety of what she asked me to share. Um, and Mr. Chair, I think it's important to note one other thing. Those of you that it, were on the Regional Growth Committee in 2023, when we considered the full Regional Transportation Plan, are familiar with the requirements that exist on WFRC as an organization, as a metropolitan planning organization, when there is an environmental impact statement process conducted that reaches a conclusion on regionally significant projects, we are required as an MPO to incorporate the results of that EIS into the regional transportation plan. Some of the projects that are noted that Jory just went through, including the modifications with regard to the um, I-15 Davis Salt Lake are in fact the product of just such a completed EIS. So I just wanted to remind you of that role and obligation that WFRC has that we have talked about with you before. Great update. <clears throat> I think you had a comment, thank you. Yeah, I just, um, I, a clarification on one of the projects. So on the I-15 Box Elder County, is into which needs based and fiscally constrained phases would that be amended? Phase one for both of them. Um, there is a project up there in the current plan to widen it, but it's an unfunded project. This would be passing lanes. Um, currently it's a two lane configuration uh, north of Brigham City. And uh, often uh, the, the tractor trailers and semi trucks are passing each other and um, it causes quite a bit of an issue. So this would be just additional passing lanes Both um, phase in, in each direction. We would leave the, the widening of the project uh, still in the plan um, out in the unfunded uh, portion of our plan. Thanks. <clears throat> Great question, thank you. Okay, any other comments before I go for a motion? Hearing none and seeing none then, do I <clears throat> make a motion to release the level three full amendment projects and the air quality conformity determination found in the air quality conformity memorandum number 42 to a 30 day public comment period for amendment number one to the 2023 through 2050, 2050 RTP. Do I have an amendment or do I have a motion as I just explained? So moved. Okay, thank you. Do I have a second? This is Don Ramsey, I'll second it. Okay, thank you. Okay, all in favor, aye. say aye. Aye. Okay, all opposed say nay. Okay, hearing none. <clears throat> I think I, motion approved. Mr. Chair, just for respectfully, I, I saw Professor Ewing unmute and I think he, he attempted to say nay. Uh, I'm sure he did. And I just wanna be with, uh, with uh, respect and apologies to Professor Ewing. I wanna remind him that he is a welcome but a non-voting member of the Regional Growth Committee. However, the minutes to this meeting will, will amply reflect uh, Professor Ewing's uh, comments that, uh, and concerns that were expressed. I forgot that I, I, I'm a non-voting member. <laughs> okay, so, so that's, for, forget the name. Well, we do appreciate your input. You provide some interesting uh, comments. I thank you. Okay, Jory, anything else you want to follow up with? Quick reminder, level one projects will be, will be reviewed after um, next week's regional council meeting uh, with the chair and vice chair. Appreciate your approval of the level two projects. Uh, we'll go out to that public comment. I, like I mentioned, we'll post that tomorrow, uh, March 22nd out to April 23rd. Um, expect an email, um, elected officials um, uh, addressing each county uh, council of governments um, for Box Elder, Davis, and Salt Lake. We'll send those out uh, beginning of next week. Um, look forward to seeing you all in May. Mr. Chair, if I could, uh, I, I wanna um, thank Professor Ewing for raising this important point. And I wanna highlight that if you as the Regional Growth Committee would like us in the development of the, uh, this regional transportation plan process to um, explore the ad addressing induced traffic, we can do that at your direction. 
Great comment. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Jory. Okay, good discussion. Thanks for the input. Okay, well now we have uh, number six was the planning technical assistance for local governments. Today we're going to learn about the new group of awarded projects <clears throat> through the transportation and land use connection program. We will also consider the stationary plans for both West Jordan and Midville for certification. Both the TLC projects and stationary plans are about local governments implementing a share of the Wasatch Choice vision. Megan, lead us away. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I, and I, don't, I know that time is constrained, but this is really exciting and important. And so I hope I can have um, a few more minutes of your time. So these uh, items, the transportation and land use connection, pro new projects, and the station area plan certification are lumped together in one item for a reason. And that's because we want you to know we have lots of different planning technical assistance available here at the Wasatch Front Regional Council. I'll talk first about the TLC program. The clicker is not the mic. Okay, um, I'll talk first about the Transportation and Land Use Connection Program. So this is our main, this is kind of our hub of planning technical assistance. It's our flagship program. It's been around for a decade now, and it's our most flexible. So the, plan, the TLC program can fund plans and studies. It can fund policies and ordinances and other things like implementation strategies. Maybe you have um, a center with all the plans in place and just you're not getting that development interest like you want, or maybe you have a tricky active transportation connection and we need to dive into the weeds on how to make that connection happen. And we can do all kinds of things through the TLC program and we get lots of creative applications from all of you and we love that. Um, projects really need to meet the TLC goals. It's about maximizing the value of investment in public infrastructure, enhancing access to opportunities, increasing travel options, and uh, creating places to live, work, and play. And so those goals are really broad. A lot of them match the goals within your general plans and your visions, and they match our Wasatch Choice vision. So the TLC program is also working to implement the Wasatch Choice vision. TLC partners include UDOT, UTA, Salt Lake County, and of course, WFRC. We administer this program and we have new awards. So this year we're making about 1.767 million in awards. Um, about a million and a half of that is TLC funding and about 200,000 of that is local match. Um, this is, a, this is a, a, a small match for planning dollars. It's the same 6.77%. Um, so it's, it's a really good bang for your buck um, if you're looking to do a planning project. We have 11 projects, five in Salt Lake County, five in the ogden Layton urban area, and one in Tooele County, and I'll present those now. So in the ogden Layton urban area, we have a Clearfield Transportation Master Plan, a Clinton General and Small Area Plans Project. This is huge, this is a big project and we're doing lots of planning in Clinton City. A Kaysville Small Area Plan, this is implementing a Wasatch Choice Center. I just got a, I got a, one of these from Mayor Tran, I love it. Um, Salt Lake, uh, North Salt Lake is going to be continuing to implement their town center urban design, through urban design standards. Lots of work in North Salt Lake to make this center happen. This is an example of um, a project where we're continuing to look for solutions to implement something. And in Davis and Weber counties, we're funding a market analysis around the Three Gate Trail, looking at not only, you know, politically, how do we make this happen? There's lots of energy around the Three Gate Trail right now, but also what, what might that mean for land use surrounding the trail? So awesome projects in the ogden Layton area. And in Salt Lake County, we've funded a Bluffdale Active Transportation Master Plan, a Midvale Parks and Open Space Master Plan, as well as in Midvale, we're going to be looking at the Porter Rockwell Trail. There's a connection through Midvale that's much needed to make that trail a regional amenity um, through that section of the county. And then Riverton, we're doing a combined active transportation and transportation master, pl master plan update. Um, lots of transportation planning in the southwest portion of the county. We love to see it. And Salt Lake City will be continuing to work on their Grand Boulevards concept along 5th South and 6th South entrances into our downtown. And in Tooele County, we have Stockton's first project the Stockton Town Comprehensive General Plan and Code Updates efforts. So we'll be writing some zoning and doing Stockton's General Plan. So really exciting batch of projects. We love it. Um, this is a preview of an updated interactive map. It's not quite live yet, but will be soon. And it provides just a lot more information about the projects. You can really look at your city and look at what you've accomplished through TLC so far, see where we're at with some of the projects. That 107 complete projects makes me really happy. 
we've been doing this for a long time and um, the projects just get better and better. So keep coming to TLC for your planning technical assistance needs. Next, I'm gonna talk about stationary planning, another planning technical assistance opportunity we offer here, mostly to help you do stationary planning in response to 2022's House Bill 462, which requires stationary planning around fixed rail and bus rapid transit stations, half mile around your rail stations, quarter mile around bus rapid transit stations. The goals of this are to increase the availability and affordability of housing, to promote sustainable environmental conditions, to enhance access to opportunities and to increase transportation choices and connections. Um, those probably sound a little bit like Wasatch Choice too, and that's by design, right? This is all helping implement the vision, but getting into the local details. The station area plans need to contain a vision, a map of that half mile radius, a five-year implementation plan. That's kind of the important fun piece. How are we gonna make it happen? Um, you have to describe how you're meeting the objectives and you have to engage stakeholders. We have 5 million ongoing funding through, sorry, not ongoing, rolling availability funding through GOEO. We're partnering with UTA and the Mountain Land Association of Governments on this work as well. Here's a little bit of a snapshot of where we are. Today, we're considering seven station area plans that were submitted for your review. And we have 17 certified so far. So this is looking better and better every time we show it to you. We like to see that. We've received 19 applications for station area plan technical assistance, but there's plenty more where that came from. Um, the deadline is approaching. So if your cities are still thinking about how you wanna tackle this, call me. <clears throat> Here's what we'll be considering today. So that number said seven, though you'll see five stations. That's the West Jordan City Center Station, Historic Gardner Station, Bingham Junction, Midvale Fort Union, and Midvale Center Station. It says seven because two of those stations share their station area amongst West Jordan and Midvale. So we have to consider those separately. Each city has their own responsibility to plan for those portions of that station area. We will look at three of the stations within one plan, a combined effort between West Jordan and Midvale absolutely an option. If you share a station area, we'd love to work with both of your cities together to plan that. And we'll look at the second set of stations in just, just Midvale, in the Midvale Center and Fort Union tracks station areas plan. We're gonna consider these city by city rather than station by station. So first, we're gonna talk about West Jordan. Those stations are Bingham Junction, Historic Gardner, and West Jordan City Center. And who better to talk about this than Mayor Burton himself? Um, joined by staff over here, Taylor is here to um, support. I just happen to be here, so thank you for letting me come. <laughs> a great pleasure. This is the part you've all been waiting for, right? It's worth waiting for. This is really good. I want to give you a little preface on this. Before the legislators ever came up and said, you need to do these station area plans, we were working on our station area plan over there. We just didn't call it that, so now we do. And we are working with UTA on there. But what's really cool is now when the legislators came and did that, they put some money in to Wasatch Front Regional Council who passed that on to us. We got the consultants together and then we teamed up with Midvale. Thank you, Midvale. You've been a lot of fun to work with. What great next door neighbors we have. And so we were able to combine all our actions together and ta-da, wait till you see what this looks like. It's gonna make you guys so excited. You're gonna wish you had a track station in your city as well because it, it's, it's just gonna be some, doing some fantastic cool things. And Taylor's, I'm gonna let him do most of talking about this, but as you look at this, Taylor's our planner and he is so good at this. In fact, we're planning more, so there'll be more coming so you guys will get to come back. But after Taylor discusses about this, and he's heard me say this before, but I'm gonna say it again. He is such a good planner that he customized this for what our needs are, and they're different than any other station area plan you've seen, seen before. It's kind of some things you haven't seen. So I just want to tell you, this plan is tailor-made. <laughs> You're welcome. Go ahead. Well, uh, thank you, Mayor and Meg. Um, really, this plan has been, I, I've worked on a few master plans uh, in my career, but this has been, I think, the most involved and the most successful one I've worked on. And that comes from, you know, uh, leadership and assistance we've had with WFRC, with Byron helping us, uh, our uh, partnership with Midvale, UDA, UTA, and Jordan School District and local businesses. We've got buy-in that I don't think we ever expected to get. The mayor mentioned that we've been planning this area for a while. We've actually had six failed plans 
before the WFRC um, chipped in with some funding and we uh, worked together. And so uh, not only did we get this one approved through our city council, but it was overwhelmingly approved with uh, a lot of excitement and uh, enthusiasm behind it. Um, it's going to allow us in West Jordan to create a, a sense of place along uh, Redwood Road in our city center that we really lack. Um, driving down Redwood Road, sometimes it's really hard to tell when you're in what city. And I think through this uh, opportunity, we're actually going to be able to create a downtown in this location um, that'll be really unique. And then um, the vision then extending to historic Arthur and across the river into Bingham Junction will also allow us to plan in a, a cohesive way that will honor our traditions of our past, uh, enhancing some of those gateways, but also uh, sharing that vision for Midville and West Jordan, which sometimes get overlooked just uh, driving past them to go to Salt Lake. And it's going to really help us to uh, create something in the southwest uh, portion of the county that we're really excited about. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Mr. Chair, if it's all right, any questions? Any questions? Okay. I'm not going to give a question, but I might add that this is where our, our city hall is. So this is really at the heart of our community. So we've got our city hall there. We have our justice buildings there. We've got our parks there. We've got the trains going through there. We've got Redwood Road there. We've got bus lines going through there. We don't have bicycle routes on Redwood Road there. You don't? Okay, thanks. Oh, we appreciate the passion that you share with us. This is pretty exciting. Um, Okay, so you have comments? everything you need in your packets to to um, see that we've reviewed these plans thoroughly. I know we're just highlighting some things here today, but you have the plan. You have the submission from the city. Um, you have our staff checklists and everything. Um, so I just want to make sure everyone knows you do have more information. And, and um, there's a suggested motion on the screen, screen, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Megan, you're absolutely correct. Okay. Um, any other comments or questions before we go for a motion? Okay, with that in, and, and I certainly don't necessarily need to read it. <clears throat> if you would like to make a motion, would you mind reading what you're seeing up there? And then we'll get a second. <clears throat> Mayor Stanger, please. I'll, I'll move to recommend clarification of the station area plan covering the following stations in West Jordan. Certification. 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 We're all clarified. We've already been through it. <laughs> Recommend certification of the station area plan covering the following stations in West Jordan, Bingham Junction, Historic Gardner, and West Jordan City Center. Perfect, Mayor. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any further comments before hearing none? Uh, do I have a motion? Excuse me. We've got the motions. All, all approval. Uh, would you say aye? Aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Congratulations, Mayor. Looks like you got your certification. Thank you. Okay, so the red line is the one we're talking about. Come visit it. Come see my office. Okay. okay. Obviously, we need to get on red line and come see it. Perfect. Okay, Megan, next okay. one. Okay. Four more station area plans to, to clarify here, Mayor Sanger. So we've got Midvale as well. These stations include Bingham Junction, Historic Gardner, those are the same two from West Jordan, but they cross into Midvale, so we're doing it for Midvale also. And then Midvale, Fort Union, and Midvale Center from a, a different station area plan. Um, I would rather have Adam talk about this than me. Would you, would you like Adams with Midvale? Uh, thank you, everyone. Do I? Okay, there we go. They're all a little different. Uh, this was a really good um, opportunity that we had to work both with West Jordan and WFRC, as well as UDOT and UTA, uh, for these station area plans. I think one of the things that surprised me most, especially with the um, uh, Midvale Fort Union station, as well as the center station to some extent, was the openness of our city council and planning commission and residents to really beef up this area and make it um, something that will be memorable to Midvale. Um, and with that, how open they were to increase uh, proposed densities for those. And so we're currently working on, even though these aren't officially certified yet, we are working on amending our TOD zones in these areas to really 
increase those density levels um, as well as other um, items in those zoning districts to really kind of kickstart this area. Um, we're also even trying to reach out to some interested developers to maybe come in and help us with this. Um, but again, this has been a great opportunity. Midvale is extremely thankful for all of the help that we receive through WFRC and all of the, pro all of the programs. Um, it's really, really helped our city. And so I'm happy to answer any questions, um, but again, thank you for this opportunity. Any questions for Adam? Hearing none and seeing none, Megan? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll just say Midvale has been doing really wonderful work in their station areas. Um, for a while, there's uh, much of uh, the low to moderate income housing is in those areas. Um, if you haven't seen this area of Midvale for a while, go see it. It's a lot different than it used to be. Um, and so this, I hope, just takes the city that much further um, you have everything as well in your packets to consider these, including a positive recommendation from staff after um, consulting with UTA. And so um, I'll just look for um, okay. back to the chair. Thanks. It's not too often that we get an opportunity to have a redo. So I move to recommend certification of the station area plan covering the following stations in Midville, Bring Bingham Junction, Historic Gardner, Midvale Fort Union, and Midvale Center. Thank you, Mayor. Perfect. Do I have a second? I'll second as Midvale's <laughs> proud neighbor. I like this. Okay. Okay. Perfect. <clears throat> All in favor of this motion? Aye. Say aye. One more time. All in favor of this motion, say aye. 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 I was. <laughs> Mayor, you shared us a lot of enthusiasm. I was kind of <laughs> looking for that. Any opposed to this motion? Hearing none, motion approved. Megan, great job. Okay, welcome. Uh, this is always great. Adam, uh, congratulations from behalf of uh, your city. Uh, this is a big day. These certifications do not come easy. Uh, but I'll tell you, Megan, in all fairness to this, uh, your organization and certainly the Wasatch Regional Council has got a golden nickel here. What you do in helping us to make these things happen is phenomenal. So I can't say enough about we appreciate so much. And certainly today we now have 19 Okay, stationary plans approved. I think we walked in with 17 and we just got a couple of more now today, so. Yeah, and by our, our funny metric there, that'll be 19 plus four, which is 23. <laughs> I like it even better. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Chair. Thank you, Megan. Okay, we do have uh, number seven, <clears throat> which is key findings from the 2023 Utah Moves Comprehensive Survey. We're gonna ask Bert to basically just step up, give us some comments to this. Uh, he indicated he might be a little short in terms of taking too much time, but share as much time you feel you need to, Bert. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm gonna be very short, just because uh, we're, we're over time. Um, how many folks think that how Utahns travel has changed in the last 15 years with COVID and internet? Guessing most of us, right? The 2023, um, statewide household travel survey tells us in many, many dimensions how travel has changed in our region and across the state. And uh, in lieu of my presentation, we're going to be making a video to tell you about this project, which surveyed over uh, 9,700 Utah households um, and had them log their trips and tell us about them and telecommuting and online shopping and and, and, and many other dimensions uh, related to transportation. So we're gonna be putting the presentation in the video and we'll be getting that out to uh, members of RGC and council uh, in the coming weeks. And uh, I think there'll be a lot more to come about this study since it's such a big project and we'll look forward to maybe uh, speaking to it and discussing it at a future meeting. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Bert, look forward to seeing that. Okay, we've got just uh, one more. We're gonna walk through. This is uh, the video <clears throat> overview of the Utah Open to Public Meetings Act. Those of you who've been in office uh, understand the importance of this. Wasatch oh, Regional Council, sorry, excuse me. Kevin Cromer had a comment, I think, on the last. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Kevin, go ahead. Why don't you have, you have a comment or questions before we get to the last item? Yeah, looking forward to the video and reading more of the report. I was just wondering if in addition to the established survey design that you've been following, have you been able to incorporate the newly available um, cell phone data that you can now get that basically has every cell phone in an area? Has that been incorporated into this um, process yet? Uh, that's a great quest question, Kevin. Um, the, 
The 2023 survey was conducted with the aid of mobile devices so that respondents could log their trips using the GPS on their phone. Um, so many of the respondents took that option. But what you're talking about are some of the location-based services data sets that are available um, that they, they don't provide every cell phone uh, movement, but they but they provide a sampling of the of the way devices have moved around. Uh, we also have connected car vehicle or connected vehicle data um, as well. And yes, we have been working with um, some of those commercially available data sets. Um, but specifically to your question, is there a direct um, integration? Um, no, not yet. There really isn't an established methodology to put the household travel survey together with those commercially available data sets, but we do work with both of them. Great. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Uh, talking about the uh, Utah Open Meetings Act, let me just read this. This was such my regional call practice the compliance is by showing a short video about the Utah Public and Open Meetings Act at the first meeting of the Regional Growth Committee each year. Uh, obviously, it's not the first meeting. I encourage you to stay for this video, but I know that some of you have already received this training. This meeting will adjourn upon completion of the eight minute training video. With that then, I'd like to ask for an action, which is a motion to adjourn and get a second effective at the end of the training. Do motion. I have a motion then to adjourn after the training? Make a motion to adjourn after, after the, training. the training. I'll Thank second. you. Okay, and I have a second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, we'll go ahead and adjourn after the training. Thank you. Great meeting. Great input. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. So what's the Open and Public Meetings Act? It's the state law that ensures government actions and deliberations are openly conducted. Before we continue, keep in mind that this video is an overview and exceptions may exist based on your entity type. So what's considered an open and public meeting? It's when a governing body majority meets to discuss or act upon government business. It includes the meetings sometimes referred to as workshops or executive sessions. Regular meetings, public hearings, electronic meetings, and emergency meetings are all open and public meetings. Open and public meetings don't include chance or social meetings. A public hearing is a type of open and public meeting where citizens have a reasonable opportunity to speak. Public hearings happen when a government adopts a budget or imposes or increases taxes or fees. An electronic meeting is a type of open and public meeting that's convened electronically, such as via phone or the internet. Remember, the governing body must adopt a resolution, rule, or ordinance allowing and governing electronic meetings. An open and public meeting may be closed to discuss any of the following. A person's character, competence, or health, security personnel, devices, or systems deployment, collective hmm. bargaining, litigation, purchase, sale, or lease of property if an open discussion would prevent the entity from completing the transaction on the best terms, investigations of criminal misconduct, and private or protected information per the Utah Procurement Code, including trade secrets. Two-thirds of the governing body need to vote yes. yes to close a meeting. Quick math lesson. Two divided by three equals 66.7%. Let's say your governing body has five members. If three out of the five members vote yes, that equals 60%, which is not equal to or greater than 66.7%, which means you're one member short and instead need four out of five members to vote yes. During a closed meeting, a governing body can't interview someone applying mm. to fill an elected position, discuss filling a midterm vacancy or temporary absence, discuss the character, competence, or health of a person whose name was submitted for consideration to fill a midterm vacancy or temporary absence, or approve any ordinance, resolution, rule, regulation, contract, or appointment. If a closed meeting is discussing a person's character, competence, or health, or security personnel, devices, or systems deployment, no recording or minutes are required. However, the presiding member needs to sign a sworn written statement stating such. If the closed meeting is held for any other reason, a recording must be made. Emergency meetings may be held to discuss an urgent matter due to unforeseen circumstances. In order to hold the meeting, the best notice that's feasible is provided of the time, location, and topics to be considered. 
an attempt is made to contact all governing body members, and a governing body majority approves the meeting. Entities that hold regular meetings need to provide notice at least annually of the year's meeting schedule. As always, the notice must include date, time, and place. For entities that don't hold regularly scheduled regular meetings, 24 hours notice must be provided. All meetings, whether regularly scheduled in advance over the course of the year, or scheduled as needed, must provide no less than 24 hours notice of meeting agendas. If a public hearing is held, public notice requirements change. Make sure to distinguish between regular meeting notice requirements and public hearing notice requirements. For regular meetings, an entity is only required to notify a newspaper and doesn't need to pay to publish a notice. For public hearings, notice must be published in at least one issue of a newspaper. If a newspaper of general circulation isn't available, written notice is posted in three public places within the entity's boundaries. Regular meetings require 24 hours notice. Public hearings require seven days notice. For both regular meetings and public hearings, written notice must be posted at the principal office of the governing body, or, if no such office exists, at the building where the meeting will be held. Governing bodies must also provide notice of open and public meetings on the Public Notice website at publicnotice.utah.gov. By posting on the website and providing the email of the local newspaper, governing bodies can also meet the requirement to notify a newspaper. However, other requirements such as publishing in a newspaper still apply. Typically, posting on the Public Notice website is done by the records officer, recorder, or clerk. However, it's the governing body's responsibility to ensure notice is provided. State Archives has prepared a training manual and quick guide for owners and posters, as well as training videos that can be accessed at their website at archives.utah.gov. If your entity is increasing a fee or undergoing truth and taxation for a property tax increase, be aware that there are additional notice and posting requirements. Public meeting agendas need to include reasonably specified topics to be considered, with each topic listed under a separate agenda item on the meeting agenda. The governing body may not consider a topic in an open meeting that wasn't on the agenda. If a new topic not on the agenda is raised by the public during an open meeting, the governing body may discuss the topic. Mm -hmm. However, final action may not be taken on the new topic during that meeting. Meeting minutes and an audio recording are required for all open meetings, with limited exceptions. When an open or closed meeting is required to be recorded, it must be unedited and contain all the portions of the meeting. Recordings of open meetings must be made available within three days. Every entity needs to establish procedures for the governing body's approval of minutes. Pending minutes are written minutes prepared in draft form and are subject to change before being approved by the governing body. Pending minutes must contain a clear indication, such as a draft or pending watermark, that the governing body hasn't yet approved the minutes and that they're subject to change. Pending minutes must be made available within 30 days. Approved minutes are written minutes of a meeting that have been approved by the governing body. Approved minutes are the official record of the meeting and must be made available within three business days. Whoever is responsible for taking the minutes during meetings typically the records officer, recorder, or clerk, needs to be familiar with what OPMA requires be contained in the minutes. When a governing body closes a meeting, the following must be publicly announced and entered into the minutes of the open meeting at which the closed meeting was approved. The reason or reasons for holding the closed meeting, the location where the closed meeting will be held, and the vote of each member of the governing body either for or against the motion to close the meeting. The recording and any minutes must include the date, time, and location of the meeting, the names of the governing body members present and absent, and the names of all others present except where disclosure would infringe on the confidentiality necessary to fulfill the original purpose of closing the meeting. For more information, access our local government resource center at resources.auditor.utah.gov.